to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew, chapter 7. And uh, we're going to look today at a passage of Scripture that I could not get out of my head this week. And um, maybe it's for me today and you're just here to participate. That's okay. Um, sometimes, you know, a pastor puts together a message and, and you know, as you're assembling all the components and you're, you're thinking of the family and how this might affect them, how it might help them, how it might bring conviction, how it might bring change. There are some times where that has to be all about me. And, 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 but this is just something that just, just stuck with me all week. And I keep coming back to it. So I said, okay, Lord, we're going to talk about it today as a family. And we're just going to just see what God has to share this morning. So let's go ahead and, and pray this morning and just get our hearts centered on him. God, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for the creation that we are a part of. As we open this word today, these are your words, God. Place them in the hearts that need it. Place them in the lives that so desperately need to hear. Encourage us, empower us, and strengthen us. Give us clarity to our lives, not someone else's today. Give us placement for these words that we would be more than just a listener today, that we would invoke action and do. Father, give us that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 13, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to to life and few find it. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but in inwardly are ravaging wolves. You're recog- you'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does, doesn't does produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire so that you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name. Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Some powerful words written there. Uh, if you have a red letter edition, you know they're all in red. Written there, uh, penned and given through the Lord Jesus Christ as his words. There's a lot of content here, and I know that I, I might be able to get it done in about an hour. Is that Okay. Anybody slow cooker going to cook less than that? I apologize for your cold roast. If you've done it right, then you put it on slow cook and it'll be ready by the time you get home later this afternoon. This is good stuff and it's relevant to where we're at today. Let's just go back and I just want to unpack each verse. Enter the, through the narrow gate for the, the gate is wide and the road is broad. That leads to the, the happy promised land? No, to destruction. Yeah, I often see, and I'm sure you've seen adaptations of this picture. There's a cross covering the great vast uh, expanses of hell, and there's fire coming up, and there's this skinny, tiny, one-man pathway through the cross, and it's a beautiful picture, and I love it. I, I just love it. And it's really narrow, and only you can only pass one person at a time through it. And But then there's this other road that's wide, and there's just piles of people going that direction. It's a great picture of what, what we're reading here in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's a great picture to depict exactly what's happening in our world today. In the world at that time, but also today, that's never changed. The wide road is one that, oh, where is everybody going? I'm reminded of a trip I took once with my wife on our honeymoon. We were in New York City and we're walking. I, I walked her at least 100, 100 blocks. And New York City blocks, you know what a, that's bigger than around here. They're big blocks. <clears throat> so after walking all the way into Greenwich Village, <clears throat> she looked at me and I looked at her and we're like, we're going to get a cab. So we took a cab and we were headed back up town. And so 
It was a death ride, by the way. We almost died that night. We were only married just a, a day or so, and we almost died. I don't know that the cabbie understood where we were going because he didn't speak English. And I don't know that he understood the idea that going 90 miles an hour between New York City blocks was not safe. We would fly to the next light and screech on the brakes. And Debbie and I on these fake leather seats slid from side to side, and up forward and back and forth. And it was awful. And I got thinking about that ride. But more importantly, when we got to our final destination, we were still a little, you know, muffled and bewildered. And, and we got out and we saw this crowd of people and we saw these barricades these wonderful barricades. And so we walked to see what was going on. We followed the crowd to find out that we were so cold and a little, you know, grateful to be alive, we decided to go get something hot to drink. So we left the crowd and went. Come to find out we were right in front of the stage of the lighting of the Christmas tree. We would have been right in front of all the celebrities performing all those wonderful Christmas songs and we had the best seat in the house. And we left it. To go get coffee. Praise God. Gave me a great example of what it means to follow a crowd. We didn't know what we were following. We just followed the people. We saw a barricade. We thought something's going on. Having been from New York, having been in the city, I knew that there's never a time that something isn't always going on in New York. How do we go through life? Are we following a crowd to some sort of destruction? It says that the, the narrow gate is only traveled by few, but the broad gate is wide. And it seems attractive and decorative and appealing and enticing. We, you know, maybe these are going to be harsh words today, so just everybody smile at me before I get started. Go ahead. Amen. Everybody up there too. Everybody smile. Good. All right. So just, I, I just want to have a happy place. But I think we have, as Christians, as individual people, we have a tendency to follow the wrong things because it looks safe or it looks okay or we'll justify it to be okay. We're living in a time where Christians need to be challenged to do the right thing regardless of what it looks like. I know we're talking about salvation here and entering into a gate that God has provided that means that we follow a very straight truth. It's a straight path. It's not deviated with all kinds of destruction or distractions. It is a straight path. And we that have received and entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we still have a tendency to follow the old man, to do the things that we want to do, to do the things that we've always done. I mean, after all, I go to church on Sunday. Isn't that enough? Or I put money in an offering plate. Isn't that enough? I've already prayed and asked Jesus into my heart. Isn't that enough? No, it's never enough. Our faith without works is dead. And we have a responsibility to still live a truthful and honest life before God. It's a straight and narrow path. And we want to dabble in all kinds of things that the enemy will use. Is it going to destroy you? Listen, if your life is assured in Jesus Christ, he can't do that. But he can definitely destroy your way. He can distract you so much that you miss out on what he has for you in this life. Straight and narrow is the way that God has provided. We have to stop dabbling in the things that the world says it's okay to do. When this body has been described to us as the temple of the Holy Spirit, I better take care of this thing. It's already working in its own way to, to end. From the moment we were born, we grow into this age, and at some point it's going to stop working. But I've got to take care of it while I'm here. What does this body represent? It's the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. What am I doing to preserve it? What am I putting in it and on it? How am I presenting this temple to others? What do they see in me? One of our greatest Bible tracts that we own that is, has no ink, no paper, is who we are. And there are some people in your walk of life, in your circle of friends, in your area of influence, that you may be the only Jesus they ever see. What does that really look like? What does that look like? 
I became convicted. There are times where, you know what, we're just fleshly. What does that mean? It means I'm as carnal and sinful as the next person. We are out here in this world, and are we representing Christ 24-7? We are littered with all kinds of influences and opportunities to do things wrong, to say things wrong, to entertain the wrong thing. He says, enter through the gate that is narrow, for the gate that is wide and broad leads to destruction. If I, I promise you, I, I love it when people come to say, preacher, is it okay if I do this? It's not really written out in here. It, right here it is. If you didn't see it before, right here it is. Because narrow is the way. Jesus wants us to live a life of truth. To influence people with truth. Not something that makes them feel better. Sometimes the truth hurts. Years ago, when Debbie and I were first married, I owe you about $20 today. Just letting it go. Just I'll open the wallet, it's all you. Anyway, when we were first married, you know, we were learning each other, developing that, that rhythm and rhyme to life. And she said to me one time, does this look okay on me? Of course it does. It looks beautiful. You look beautiful. There was one time she didn't ask. I was in the doghouse. Only when you're asked for things, you know, are you to give an opinion. Sometimes the truth hurts. Now, I got to tell her, you know, to be honest, if it looked bad, in some fashion in the back of her mind, she thought, well, that's a, I'm grateful she, that he told me that it didn't look right. But sometimes the truth is painful, isn't it? Sometimes to hear that, I mean, I, I look forward to every day when someone tells me I'm doing it wrong. I mean, those are just days I can't wait to get up. You know, you've done it all wrong today. Everything you've touched today has just crumbled. And I get excited about life. So not true. Because we are, in fact, people of affirmation. We want to be affirmed. We want to fit in. We want to be a part of the story. We want to be part of that, oh, you know, the Joneses are doing this, so let's do that. We have to live a life that is separate. We are called to do things differently. When we're in public, what is our representation of Christ? When we're in private, what is our representation of Christ? When we're in front of family, oh, well, fam you know, I can let my hair down there. No. What is our area of influence and what does that look like? If it's, let me just say, if it's, if it's an area where you have to question, you better, you better lean in the, in the area of following God. If I haven't done it before and felt good about it, and in, in Christ, we ought to be almost provoked that it's wrong. We know what we just did was dumb. Sometimes it's hard to stop words falling out of our mouth. Sometimes it's hard to stop full motion. But that connection back to the truth is so important. It says here, there are many that go through it. 14, nar how narrow is the gate and how difficult the road that leads to life. But few find it. God has never promised inside the relationship that he has established with us that everything will be sweet, smooth, and wonderful. And don't get me wrong, let me just say it this way. Being a part of the family of God is wonderful, and it is sweet. But it is not always easy and smooth. It is when we change our perspective. When we recognize that the bump in the road that we just hit was there to get our attention. When, when the pothole we just ran through and fell over flat on our face was there so that we had somewhere to look up to because we haven't been looking. Have you ever considered that what we face in this journey is many times what God is trying to do to draw our attention back to him? To get our eyes on the straight and narrow. Is it really that important that we have everything that the neighbors have or that we do everything that our friend circle does? I, I often remember, not fondly, but remember high school and junior high. What a, what a painful time in life that was. Trying to fit in, please friends that didn't really care about you in the first place. I, I came from meager means, so if I had a pair of designer sneakers, man, whoo. 
And being the first boy in my family, they were new. I didn't get hand-me-downs. I didn't get the girl stuff, praise God. The girls all got hand-me-downs. I got new stuff. But it wasn't always designer because it wasn't just that way. I'm grateful that my mother was able to make my sister's dresses, and, and they were beautiful and all that, but she was never gifted at making boys' clothes all that well. Amen. I might have looked Amish. I'm not sure. Amish from Gabe's, you know, a little irregular. I don't know if the zippers would have matched up or the buttons. It's okay. But I remember getting that shirt from JCPenney's. It arrived in the mail. She ordered out of a catalog. Some of you, how many know what a catalog is? <laughs> Amen, good shoppers. All this younger generation goes, what? It wasn't on Amazon? No. But she would pick out a shirt. You know what I learned to do is sit with that catalog and look at that and envy the things in it. My brother and I would sit for hours. You know, you get the Christmas wish book and you start to circle things. Woo! We did that with the big catalog for the whole year, you know, the whole year. And, and I, I would circle, oh, I like that couch. I like that picture. I like that lamp. We were filling our house because our house was mismatched. It was, when you have as many kids as we had, it's just, it is what it is. You know, we weren't sitting in the dark, and we always had food to eat, and we had clothes on our body, and praise God for that. But to envy those things sometimes, there's nothing wrong with looking at that and saying, boy, it would be nice to have some nice things. But why do we have to have everything that we have to have? Do you realize, maybe this is an illumination to you, but we're not here for the long haul. Okay, this is a vapor of life. This is just a segment in time, a blip of eternity. And we spend it by filling our lives with a thousand things. And it's not just stuff, it's, it's acquiring titles and positions and power. Our greatest influence is how can we influence people to see the narrow way is the way to go, even though it's challenging, even though it's hard. It's worth it in the end because it is the way of life. The way of life. You know what? We think sometimes we're living because we have everything we've ever wanted. For now. In the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus is preparing a place for us. A place we can't even imagine. When I first learned that verse, we were actually living in what was our parsonage. It was a camper that had been converted into a trailer that had been converted into, I don't know what. It was a small country church, and they did the best they could, and we made it work. But I can remember looking at that, and I'm thinking, when it says that he's going to prepare a place for us, a mansion, I went, yes! No more camper living. You know, a room that I don't have to share with my sister. How weird is that? You know? Our ideals of what, it, we can't even imagine what it is. The best house on this planet that you have ever been a part of or seen or experienced can't even hold a candle to what God has prepared. And whether it's a house with walls and lights and rooms, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. But it's a place, if nothing more, I know that Jesus will be. To see him face to face. The road to life. Is it not worth it to go through a little trouble to have something that is so worth it? It is so worth it. I love the statement, worth the wait. I don't like it to be told to me, but I do like it in its, in, in its definition. Things are worth the wait. Sometimes it's worth the wait for the most awesome piece of cheesecake you could ever have. Debbie made me take a piece yesterday of hers. She forced it down my throat. I barely leaned in for it. I, it, I was just so, it was amazing. It was awesome. Can I imagine for a moment that they would hold that out in front of me and say that you have to wait an hour for that and I could just stare at it? It's worth the wait. I know that's trivial and sometimes comical, but are we really looking at what comes next as worth the wait? Is it worth the journey? Because it's hard. 
You know, m- month after month, we hear about missionaries and their work on the field, and, and we hear about the struggles and the challenges. We hear about circumstances that are life-threatening, and sometimes they, they, they require the life. I'm, I'm reminded of Elizabeth Elliot and her family and how that, that whole story of the, these men that were taken over by the, this group of cannibals and how this just, how could she return to that same field? It's worth the wait to know what eternally is valuable. We view life from what we're looking at. And scripture says we need to view life from what I'm telling you, what it will be. Have you ever often wondered what the smells of heaven might be like? I I know that when you go to Sight and Sound Theater and you walk in, you smell roasting almonds. That might be the smell. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I know that when you come into a church on a, on a night where there's a potluck dinner, huh, there's an aroma about a church dinner that just, wow. The Bible says that when we arrive in heaven, there's going to be this great banquet, this, this feast. And I, I can almost imagine some of the aromas. I don't know what foods are going to be there, by the way. I, I have no idea. I know that I won't complain because I'll be perfect. I I know there won't be anything on the table I won't be interested in. It'll all be good. Have you often wondered what the temperature would be like? We complain a lot about that, don't we? We got people come into church. Oh, it's so cold. Oh, could we turn on the fans? Nobody's ever completely satisfied. Have you ever wondered what heaven will be like temperature-wise. I've I've often said on really, really hot days, I'm so glad heaven's climate-controlled. Amen? It just fits everyone's climate. Why why is this necessary, Pastor, to go down this thinking process? It's because we got to look at what's coming, not what's happening now. We have to look forward to what God is preparing for us. In this journey, we got a lot to do, and there's bumps, and there's hurdles, and there's, there's all kinds of distractions. We have to remain faithful and keep our eyes on that goal. It's so worth it. It is so worth it. It says, be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are wolves. I see a picture of a wolf trying to hide under a sheepskin. You all see that? How could you not see it? I mean, the feet don't match the, the, the sheep. The, the snout is hanging out past the, 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 you know, the, the sheep's clothing. I mean, clearly you can see this is not really a sheep. But isn't it amazing how deceived we can be to follow something that's not in this book, that's not on these pages? Just because it sounds good? Just because someone's trying to build a kingdom here? To fund their kingdom here? And so they'll say anything that sounds good to do that? How often have we followed the wrong thing? You know, the Bible encourages us to check these things. Check it. Look at it. Find it. When a preacher or a Bible study leader gives you a scripture, go look it up. By the way, the greatest sound in church is not the music. It's not the the instruments. It's not even the amens. You know what the greatest sound in church is? Do you all hear that? That's the greatest sound. That means you're, you're prepared. You're a student of this word. You have it. I love it when people have pens out and highlighters and they're ready for it. They they don't want to forget it. They're hanging on every word because the word of God is life to us. It's relevant. Yes, even the Old Testament is relevant. By the way, if you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going. True statement. You got to know where you came from. 
we, we, we have the ability to read this at any time. We should know whether it's true. Right? It should be obvious to us as believers. To have a discernment about what's being said or done. And yet, if we're not in this book, if we're not flipping through these pages, if we're not consuming the words on the pages, we're not going to see it. We're not going to see it. The Bible says in the last days, people will fall away and follow a truth that, or a, a falsity that is in fact described and disguised as truth. Completely in error. And they're going to they're gonna love it and gravitate towards it and celebrate it. And we're living in that time. We're living in that time. I got to close. So what's the challenge today? I'm by no means finished, by the way. I, I know. I, I, I really want to preach on, but I won't. The challenge today is this. Pay attention. Open your eyes. First and foremost, if you don't know Jesus Christ today as your personal Savior, we want to make sure you take care of that today. I would hate for you to have walked through these doors and just been entertained by anything that we've done, said, or participated in. Or feel that this is just about giving an offering and participating, and God has taken attendance and said, oh, so-and-so is here today. You've been brought into this room and you entered through these doors in order to be a participant in hearing that Jesus loves you. He took your place on the cross so that you could have salvation. You could have that promise and that hope that when your life is required of you here on this earth, you will be in his presence. And not only in his presence, but spend eternity there. The Bible describes it that you'll spend eternity somewhere. You'll either burn in hell or you're going to celebrate in heaven. It's one or the other. There's no in-between. I don't care what church or what pastor or what teacher or what doctor, document you looked at. There is only one way to heaven. It is not through living a good life or doing the right things. It's about knowing that Jesus took your place and receiving that free gift of love. Can you say amen, church? That is the gospel. We are to be about the gospel. And not to sugarcoat it so that you feel comfortable or that we can check off we made a decision and we baptized that. We baptized this many. Well, what whoop de do? If it's in vain and if it's not true, what's the point? The gospel is what is important. And sometimes the truth is I, I need to hear that it's not because I'm a good person or that I think I did things right. But it's because I chose to follow Jesus. So if you're here today and you've never done that, we want to give you that opportunity. But to those of the household of faith, those that have already surrendered to Jesus, listen to me. Keep your eyes on the straight and narrow. Quit dabbling in the world. We're, to, we're here. We're here for a purpose. We're not here to be a participant in everything that goes on here. We have a single purpose, and that is to exist, that we represent Jesus Christ. Pay attention to what others see in you this week. Last week we challenged you. God, send me one. Send me one person. Don't change that prayer. Keep praying that prayer. Keep your eyes on the truth. Do, do people see Christ in my life? Do they see my reactions, my actions? Do they blend with the world or do they blend as being separate. Who cares if they think I'm weird? Who really cares? Because if they point them to Christ, isn't that the whole thing? I, I got to quit worrying about the peer group. Because Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. Make your eyes focus to the purpose would you stand with me let's close Christians are praying eyes are closed heads are bowed I want to give an opportunity here
you're here today and you have never called on the name of Jesus. You've never ever once recognized that you were a sinner in need of salvation. The Bible says that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We cannot receive heaven. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. With those statements, the Holy Spirit has been working on your life. And you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I need him to be Lord of my life. So I'm going to ask you to pray this simple prayer. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. Save me. And Lord, I place you in lordship over my life. You're here today. You've prayed that prayer. Would you please tell me by raising your hand? I promise I won't drag you to the front. I promise I won't come down there to you. I'm just asking you right now where you're at to be bold in your step that you've just received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'd love for you to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer. Is there anyone? Amen. Anyone else? Praise the Lord. Father, in this place, you know the hearts and the minds of each person here. The gospel is not a word that will return void. When it goes out, it is effective. It is powerful. Thank you, God, for those hands that went up. Lord, I pray that you would solidify in their life right now this transaction that took place today. As believers, Father, we pray to you and we ask for your help that we would keep our eyes on the, on the, on the focused prize, and that's you. Help us to quit dabbling in the world and, and playing with the world, but to live lives that are separate and different. That by our lifestyle and by our choices, we draw attention back to our Creator. Give us boldness today to do that. Lord, give us courage because clearly we're afraid of it. Thank you, God, for your grace today. And we pray this in Jesus' name.